travel back in time with us thousands of years from an enthralling Egyptian odyssey. We'll walk in the footsteps of the pharaohs, cruise the languid waters of the Nile, and gaze at Cairo's twinkling lights from a felucia. There's a reason Egypt has lured travelers through the ages and continues to be one of the most popular destinations worldwide. History and mystery are powerful pools for adventurous souls, and Egypt is awash in both. We'll visit Cairo's King Tut, whose discovery spawned a global pop culture. Giza's mythical Great Sphinx and the Great Pyramid, the oldest and most intact of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Luxor's Valley of the Kings, one of the most famous archaeological sites on the planet, a royal burial ground for scores of pharaohs who ruled more than 3,000 years ago. We'll be dazzled by the illuminated temple of Luxor and Karnak at night, their massive pillars holding up the sky. We'll visit Aswan's monuments, the giant awe-inspiring temples of Ramses II and Nefertari, both UNESCO World Heritage Sites and legendary city of Memphis. We'll visit the High Dam and the Temple of Philae, built to honor the goddess Isis, mirrored on the waters surrounding its island. As we sail down the Nile on a tour through time aboard a five-star luxury vessel, we imagine life when the enormous treasure-filled tombs were built and marvel that they still stand today. We explore the ancient town of Edfu by horse-drawn carriage and close our eyes to see the Egyptians who walked its streets centuries ago. Our journey ends in Saqqara at the Steppe Pyramid, one of the oldest stone structures in the world. Just as the stones endure through millennia, our memories of Egypt will last a lifetime. Our custom trips are drawn from a menu of enticing experiences with something interesting for everyone. This is Michael Gilbert, CEO of iWorld of Travel, inviting you to experience another memories beyond destination. iWorld of Travel. Expect more. Do more. Welcome to the final series of the uh, our leadership webinar series for uh, 2020. I think a lot of us are happy to put a lot of ends to 2020 as we look towards 2021. Uh, we're very excited to be able to uh, feature Egypt uh, today, which has been open and been uh, hosting tourists, and uh, share with you our, our, our vision of it and introduce you to our partners out there. Let me just give you, again, a quick overview of iWorld of Travel. As you know, we've been in business since 1967. 53 plus years and you know my father was the the pioneer and leader of this organization for over four decades when I say pioneer he was a pioneer of tourism uh, to Israel back uh, in the Middle East back in the late uh, 70s early 80s when uh, outbound from the US when when people were really uh, thinking what <laughs> but my father was a visionary not only did he create the packages for travel from the US outbound whether he was working with the Christian the faith or the Jewish faith or Catholicism or any of the, uh, the, the religious groups, but he also expanded that into Egypt as well as Jordan. Uh, he was actually on one of the first flights of El Al uh, that landed, if you saw any, any of our posts in the past, one of the first flights from El Al, El Al landing in Cairo as we extended uh, our friendship and our reach to Egypt. Um, our company is really focused uh, on two sides of the uh, equation. We have a commitment to the tourism boards uh, to work with them globally. We have tremendous relationships that uh, allow us to make sure that we're promoting a destination in the way that a destination is to be featured and is to be shown. And we are also 100% committed to the travel advisors. I've always been that way since 1967. We do not go to direct to consumers. We only work with the travel advisory community. And this is part of the legacy that my father uh, established for years and part of the legacy that we will carry on as long as we are in business. We will only work with the travel advisors. And, and really, in a sense, uh, we are a tour operator, as I tell everybody, but we view ourselves more as a marketing company, a marketing company that happens to be in the tourism industry that, uh, again, promotes the NTOs and provides any resources that you need as a travel advisor to be able to promote and educate uh, to your clients. Uh, the products that we work with are really all geared around FIT. I think everything is FIT, whether you're creating a solo package, whether you're doing it uh, for a family or faith-based or traditional groups, city tours, shore excursions, uh, we've always done and wellness travel. I think shore excursion is going to be a little bit of a different animal as we move forward with uh, the CDC guidelines for the cruise industry having to have complete control of their passengers. Uh, but I do see, uh, to be honest with you, family travel growing uh, immensely. It was one of the fastest growing segments of travel prior to COVID. And I think with COVID, what we're seeing is that uh, with everybody spending more time with their families and really understanding 
what they've been losing in time, right? You know, we all, we all get into a routine and, uh, and then we go to work, we come back, we spend a little time, but I think you're gonna see a real uptick in family travel uh, as we go into some part of 2021, certainly into 22 and 23, uh, family, multi-generational, skip generation, and everything that we do is always based on uh, focusing on memories beyond moments. And these aren't just your, you know, you go to a destination and you have an awe-inspiring moment. These are opportunities that allow you to immerse yourself into the culture and engage with uh, locals and what's really historically part makes that destination so special so that long after you come back after your trip you carry uh, the memory and the feeling of that in your spirit mind and soul and our company uh, has a simple mission statement we've had it forever and it's the one word it's experience uh, whether you're working for us with us or traveling with us we want your experience to be so good today that you wanna come back and work with us tomorrow. And that's all we can do is control, as we've certainly learned in 2020, we can only control what we can do and what we do today. Uh, of course, like any a company in the travel industry, we've had to uh, adjust some of our terms and conditions. Uh, first and foremost, we've increased our commissions to 18%, and this will be all the way through any bookings through the end of June, 2021, uh, by just securing a deposit. Our deposits are only $18 per person, uh, and that would be refundable and cancelable at that point. When you get 90 days out from departure, it needs to be increased to $500 per passenger, uh, and then we will uh, advance you or pay you uh, commissions on deposit. This is a program we started back in 2019 uh, that had great uh, response, uh, really, really positive. So as an example, family four, $500 per family member, $2,000. Within 72 hours, we'll have $360 in your account. And then after they travel, the balance of your commission will be paid then. Uh, 30 days out, final payment is due. At that point, it would be non-cancellable, non-refundable, and groups are 45 days out. Listen, all these things we're doing with the to advance on commissions, 18% uh, commission, is to try to do our little bit to help out as much as we can. It's been a horrific year for especially the travel advisors who have worked tirelessly. I don't just say that because you're on the call with us, but we know it. That's how we've worked with. You know, all the work you did in 19 for 20 is lost and no work for 20 for 21. So anything we can do, we want to make sure that you look at us as a resource, uh, whatever it is, whether it's presentations, uh, one sheets, uh, e-brochures, Zoom meetings, uh, we are your resource. So next, uh, let me uh, introduce you to our uh, panelists uh, that are gonna be part of the presentation today. Uh, obviously myself, Zahaba Baton, who's our Vice President of Global Sales, as well as uh, a specialist in uh, Middle East. She's done tours all over the world. Most of you probably know Zahaba. She's been in the business uh, for almost 30 years and just been, first of all, a great friend and family member for us, uh, but just a great resource uh, for everybody, not just the company, but for you. Our, a wonderful partner in Ashraf Sayed, who has been working with us for a very, very long time, and we have uh, just grown to love him, you know, and his support and his consistency and ensuring. I'll give you a quick example. We had a traveler that was out there, I think about a year and a half ago, somehow she tripped, uh, broke her ankle. This man stayed at the hospital with her uh, until she got checked out. This is the kind of partnerships that we have throughout the globe. And of course, uh, working as part of that team is Mohammed Abdel Aziz, uh, going by Zizo. And Zizo is going to take you through uh, the experience of uh, just kind of get you interested in Egypt a little bit, highlight some of the features that we think are important to look at, talk about the programs we're going to put together, and, and then we'll do some questions and answers at the end. So if you have any questions, just put them, pose them on the, the bottom of the page there, and uh, Zahawa will be uh, either addressing them during or bringing them up at the end. So at this stage, Zizo, if you want to unmute, I'm going to put you live and uh, take it away. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much, Michael. You're welcome. And okay, can we start the slides, please? Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining our World of Travel. And my name is uh, Mohammed Abdelaziz or Zizo. Uh, I'm, I'm a guide and a partner for our World Travel for, for so many years. I would love to share part of my country, Egypt, with you. This is a beautiful satellite picture for Egypt here, and you can see at the top right page, the name, it's called Egypt, and then there is another name. This is actually the ancient name and hieroglyphic that called Kemet. So once you read the ancient hieroglyphic, this is the name of the country gonna come out, and Kemet literally mean in English, the black land of Egypt. One million square kilometer or almost like 4,410 uh, 4, 4, uh, 
uh, square mile. That would be all the land of Egypt. And the population of the country is more than 100 million people. The capital is Cairo. And the location of the country is very unique because we located in Africa as well as Asia. This is not many people who actually they're not aware of. Sinai Park, which is you look like the rabbit ear to the right of the map, this area is located in Asia, and that's Sinai, where all the trail of the Israelites and the famous accidents of the Bible actually happen in there. So we had an African part of the country and the rest of Egypt, like Sinai, this is located in Asia. Geography of, of the country here, it's actually left a great impact on the, on the Egyptian civilization itself. I'm going to show you on the next slide how the geography of the country left a great impact on the country here. Here you can see a proper map. You can see on the northern part that will be Mediterranean Sea. And this is one of what we call it the natural border of the country. South, which is down the, the map itself, that will be the Nubia and the Kush. Here in that little area, we had what we call it the cataracts. What is a cataract? It's a kind of massive granite formation islands located on the southern area of the Nile. And that's again considered like a natural border. So when you look at the, at the map north and the south of Egypt, naturally they've been protected by Mediterranean Sea and by the border of the cataracts or the granite, the granite rock. In the middle of this beautiful map, you will see the Nile and the Nile looks like a flower, like a lily flower. The Nile itself goes all the way and this is a source of life. One of the earliest historians and many people, they thought that Egypt without the Nile mean nothing. Or to be honest with you, I have to mention that if there is no Nile, no Egypt. Nile, located in the middle of the country, like the backbone of the country itself and the backbone of the civilization and the culture, the Nile gives Egypt the life, give its food, the settlements, or what we call it the cities, they were on the banks of the Nile to the right, to the left, east and west. So far, at the earliest part of the civilization, we had around 42 cities that were scattered along the Nile. With the food, with the life, with the settlements, the Nile itself taught Egyptian the flood and the calendar. Every year till today, from July till October, the Nile banks come with an extra amount of water, what we call it the flood or the flood season. And that led Egyptian to put kind of a calendar for the agriculture and for the seasons and to do like records for the flood itself. With a flood, the Egyptian they divided the year only to three seasons, flood season, plantation season, and then a harvest. So we had settlements on the back of the Nile, we had the lands on the Nile, we had the food from the Nile, we had the life from the Nile. The Nile as well was like for transportation, and the Nile was for the calendar and for the Egyptian, taught Egyptian how to learn. You better look at the Nile as the source of life for the Egypt. With the Nile, to the right, to the left of the Nile, you will see what we call it the desert, which is 92% of the Egyptian land are desert. The desert is eastern desert to the right, western desert to the left. What we got out of the desert, the ancient Egyptian people from the desert, they learned many things. Number one, they learned that desiccation, or what we call it in another term, the mummification, sand and, and, and the desert itself, taught them how to preserve their bodies, how to mummify their bodies. That was number one thing they learned from the Nile. Number two, that, uh, that was for, sorry, from the desert. And number two, uh, from the Eastern and Western desert as well, the material like stone, like a limestone and sandstone and granite, Egyptian, they had it. So that was a natural material found it for them. With that, Egyptian, they, they've seen the difference between the Nile and the desert. What is a Nile and a desert there? For them, this is a concept of duality, life and death. So the whole Egyptian faith and belief start to be developed using the geography of the land, death and life, uh, what we call it sunrise and sunset. This is all what the Egyptian got from the land. So we had the Nile, that's life. We had the desert, mean death and mummification. And then we had Sinai Peninsula to the right. And this peninsula part, it was like the land bridge to the other nations and we had the trade roads located in there. We had mining, turquoise, malachites. So all those beautiful elements, there's a, the contrast, what we call it, the desert, the Nile, the peninsula, mining, stone, life, death, sunrise, sunset. This is all create what we call it, the character for the Egyptian civilization. As a result of this, the land of Egypt been divided to two sections, northern section and a southern section. The northern part, we call it lower Egypt, as you can see it on the map, up. And this is very unique because subconsciously when I tell you upper Egypt, you think north. No, in Egypt it's different because of the Nile. 
Upper Egypt means south in Egypt up here and lower mean north. So the land being divided to two sections, upper and lower, those 42 villages and cities that were scattered along the Nile, they were divided to two and troubles happened between them till somebody called Mina or Narmer, we're gonna show his picture later, he managed to unite the two lands and Egypt became united or unified. Every country of those two, they had their own symbols, they had their own crowns, they had their own even animals and gods to worship, like what we're gonna see on the next slide, please. Here, beautiful picture for what we call it the Wat crown, you know, up to the left. This is the symbol of Upper Egypt, and then the red crown at the bottom. This is symbol of Lower Egypt. And if you look to the one in the middle in between them, this is a unification. So we had Upper and Lower, and we had that top of the crown, most of the Egyptian statues. They actually had them in the top of their head. To the right of the page as well, you will see the vulture and the cobra. Those are the two Egyptian goddesses. They used to be worshipped in upper and the lower part of the land. So geography and reflection of geography comes out in those beautiful images. You will see them everywhere got repeated in the temples. You see them in the, in the tombs. They all just as a kind of sign and symbolism for the upper and the lower Egyptian part of the land itself. Next slide talks about the Nile itself. So. Uh, Herodotus, one of the earliest Greek historians, when he visited Egypt, he wrote something very interesting. He said, Egypt is a gift of the Nile. As we mentioned earlier, if you look at this nice map, the more you go south, you go up the Nile itself, you go into the source of the Nile. What is the source of the Nile? That would be Victoria Lake in Uganda. The Nile goes for almost 4,100 miles from source to mouth. Mouth will be, uh, the, the, the source of the Nile is Victoria Lake, and the mouth will be Mediterranean on the other side. This long Nile, the way it goes through all the Egyptian land and penetrate the desert and goes all up there, that was kind of an elementary aspect to the life of Egypt. We had the life, we had everything that was centralized around the Nile itself. And you can see the picture here to the right between the old, old picture of the Nile where is the rocks and the granite, the bottom one, and the upper one up there. So we had all those beautiful pictures to tell us about life in ancient time and in a modern time. Next slide, it is what we've been talking about now, the, the unification between upper and lower Egypt. This piece of stone, it's located at the Egyptian museum. We call it Narmer or Amina Palette. It is 3,100 years BC. Talks about a king came from upper Egypt and most of the greatest water of the country, they came from upper and I do think because upper, it has a kind of lack of greens, lack of agriculture. So people of upper Egypt, they were mostly hunting for, for to live. And people of the north, where is a delta, the fertile area or lower Egypt, they had this fertility and they had that beautiful crops there. So they were more like thinkers. So we had warriors in the, from the south. We had thinkers and physicians from the north. And that again, create kind of an atmosphere for Egypt and ambience for the country. This man here to the left, standing with supposed to be left leg forward, is holding in his hand, scepter, son of power, wearing the white crown and smiting the enemies, which is a man kneeling before him and people running from the bottom section. And if you look to the other side of that ballet, you will see the man celebrating the victory and he changed the crown above the head. He has the red crown and he'd been led by his vizier or his prime ministers and army's leader and the poor people to the far right of that page, they lost their head in that battle. And the middle section is very unusual. It looks like two lioness fighting one another and people stop them. That was kind of a symbolic element. Talks about the conflict that lasted for centuries and thousands of years between upper and lower Egypt. So we had this at the Egyptian museum as a dated references for the Egyptian history because we had an earlier pieces not as good, not as dated as that one up here. Moving from Narmer and the way the land of Upper and Lower Egypt, we come to a nice picture and a nice slide where you can see the desert and then a Nile and then a green. This is what we call it the concept of duality or contrast in ancient time. Duality between life and death, duality between East Bank and West Bank, city of the living and city of the death. So the Nile founded faith and the faith led to what we call it art, and art led to Egyptian thoughts and minds to be a start to create elements, writing, documentations, archive system. 
So everything comes from being relaxed. You had your food, you had everything around you. So you have a time to think and then to develop your thoughts. This is what we call it the faith that led to art. The faith that led to art without faith, Egyptian wouldn't be able to express anything. As we've seen in that beautiful ballet, the man is standing and he's just showing us off his power, his triumph, anti the Egyptians and united the land. So Egyptian art was very distinctive in a way to show kind of glory, to show power of the kings and the ruler. They use even colors as well. Sometimes it has a meaning and a symbolic stories of God, the way they were birthed, the way they were married, how the daily life scenes been reflected in the ancient Egyptian tombs and temple with those massive statues, with the posing figures, with, you know, even like the Sphinx, when you look at the Sphinx itself, it's like showing the power and the God, as, as a God and a protector for the area. So Egyptian art, it was a result of faith. And that was very observed in every single statue, temple, tombs, people they see it when they come to Egypt here. Next slide, we come to how faith, this is very important to know, 2,700 years before Christ, faith, it was actually developed in a way how we gonna reach eternity if there is a concept of duality, life and death. So what happened to after death? After death, we all should go and get connected to gods. Where is gods? Gods from the Egyptian perspective located up in the sky, they kind of dwell in the stars and in a cosmology above us. So we start, real, we start realizing Egyptian, they were so advanced in astrology, watching and observing the cosmos around them, and sometimes they reflected the cosmos on earth. This idea of I wanna go up to heaven to be with the God, to be eternal, to be immortal, comes very clear at that day, 2700 years BC, we had the amazing steps pyramids. If you wanna go up to a higher level, what are you gonna use? Steps or a ladder. So this is with a kind of a steps or a ladder to take the spirit of the dead people from earth to heaven. By mistake, some people, they think that pyramids, it's a tomb. I have to say, this is absolutely not the right answer because pyramids, not only a tomb, Pyramids is like a marina. Pyramids is like a station transforming our spirit from earthly shape to the heavenly and spiritually shape. And that comes very clear in the oldest stone pyramids ever recognized in the whole world. And before that, nobody in the whole world used stone for construction. The idea yeah. developed that uh, yes, hello, hello. Yeah, you're okay. It, it, we lost you for a second there, but you got back and you sound perfect now. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm no problem. Fine. Really fantastic, okay. by the way. Very fantastic. So we coming up to that beautiful step pyramids and the idea of, of eternity and immortality was reflected later on by the time this faith idea get more developed and developed. Look at the next slide. You see pyramids are no longer, you know, steps. Pyramids became this perfect shape, smooth surface. And why we had that? The idea of Egyptian from being and going up to heaven on a steps on an, on a, or a ladder we come to the arms of the God. They do believe at those days, Ra, their God, or the sun disk, which is their main God, is expanding his arm and touching the earth in a marvelous uh, kind of like a hug or a love or a cuddle. This cuddle is like a ramp. You'll be going from earth to heaven. And this is the idea of the Egyptian pyramids developed. By the way, when you come to Egypt here, you only see the oldest pyramids, which is Saqqara, and you see the biggest of Giza, like the one you look at it on this picture. But maybe you don't know that in Egypt, we're having 118 pyramids, 118. They're scattered everywhere. So pyramids, they're not built by aliens. Pyramids, they're not built by, you know, people from another space. No, pyramids built by Egyptian. We had many trials and errors for the pyramids. We have some pyramids, you know, the kind of the degree, the inclining degree was wrong, the burial chamber was wrong, so they were collapsed. So Egyptian, they practiced a lot 
to come to that perfection here. With the lift picture, you see an, a beautiful standing statue, and you see all, this is a great pyramid of King Cheops, which is only last October, we had a Japanese team and a Canadian team, they've done a great work inside scanning that pyramid. They discovered a size, a big like a size of a big bus, void or a space in the middle of that pyramids, which is they do believe this is, might be the real burial chamber of the Pharaoh, because so far we knew the burial chamber, but it was empty and we thought it sacked or been stolen for so many years. This great void or space, which is we found it out of scanning, the recent scanning for that pyramids, it make our minds buzzing, like what's in there? Is it like a real burial chamber for the Pharaoh and everything that we know for many years, for those centuries? They just fake idea or it was like an illusion or the Pharaoh tried to cheat us to put us somewhere and he was buried in a safer place. This is one of the, of the things that are gonna get revealed maybe by 2021. We knew more about that void and, and the mystery of that great pyramids. And we can talk for ages about this beautiful one, the number of the stone being used, how the, the pyramids achieved the golden ratio in constructions, how the pyramids of Egypt be, be, been oriented to the Orion belt and to the stars and linking them to the spirits up in heaven. It's like a great mystery. That's why I do think pyramids of Egypt and the Sphinx, they were kind of one of the ancient, the, the reason, the, 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 one of the ancient wonders of the, one of the wonder of the ancient world, sorry. We come into the Sphinx itself and the Sphinx at the statue, it was reflection to the constellation of Leu as well, located at the bottom of the pyramid. So the three pyramids of Giza, they link to the Orion belt and in the Leu constellation is the Sphinx, guarding, protecting, and unfortunately, we do see here in the statue, the, the erosions happen, the lower part and the back neck of the statue being gone, and the nose and the beard, they've been destroyed by either the French or the British or the earliest Arab. There is actually no definite answer about why the statue like this, but when you, the Sphinx, it was a god, then you was like the living image of the god, and the Greek later, when they uh, conquered Egypt, they call it the Sphinx, and the name we're still using till today, but in ancient time, that was the living image of the god. Coming picture, we show you a really nice view. Look at that view. This is like one of the earliest pictures being taken from the air for the three pyramids together. And if you look just before the pyramids, you see a little building. Those were the workers and the village for the workers who assist the pharaohs to do the pyramids. One of the best thing, if you're gonna come to Egypt really soon or visit Egypt soon, it's open to the public now. You can actually see the workers tomb. You can go up there and you see the remain of the bakeries, the remain of some of the foods, the pottery, their, their little shelters or houses where they used to live. So we had a really beautiful, you know, opening and discoveries for, for the area of the pyramids. This is a beautiful picture and the coming one as well. You will see more of the, the overview for the area. If you look at the bottom right, you can see there is a, something called, or a place called Modin Cemetery. This is where the huge village, which is almost around 10,000 workers, they used to stay up there eating bread, drinking beer, and consuming fish and meat and poultry. And one of the best discovery ever about this Modin Cemetery happened around a few years ago, like three, four years ago. They discovered a piece of ancient papyrus. And out of that piece of papyrus, we knew that birthday, Egyptian, they used to slot 300 ducks and 30 cow to feed the workers. So we knew they were workers, we knew people, they had the food being given to them. So that's really nice and interesting facts. Maybe TV or documentary movie didn't reveal them yet. So we had the worker city, we had the three pyramids, we had temples just to connect the pyramids to, to, to the afterlife. We had the Sphinx up there. We had tombs of the Nabal. This is like a life of the ancient Egypt located in one area, what we call it Giza. If we look at the pyramids, if we look at the Egyptians, how they achieved everything, so they needed writing. And I know that this is quite interesting. Some people, when they look at the hieroglyphic, they said, okay, wow, Egyptian, they put picture together to make meaning. That's, it was very right, but at the beginning. But later, those picture that carry meaning they developed to sounds and then they developed them to words and they created 26 letter. Those 26 letters, they became what we call it the hieroglyphic. And the term hieroglyphic 
literally mean sacred language. It's a language. It's a way to communicate, but only in the temple and within the temple for the gods. So it was kind of very hard to use it, to, to deal with it. So Egyptians developed this sacred language that used inside the temple. They use it for a daily one. They, they create like what we call it today, a shorthand version of it. They created demotic, which is a language to be used daily by people. And then they created heretic as well. And this was like kind of a formal English today, language between people, between educated people. So they created few things just to suit their needs and to please them in their daily life and to be used in their daily life. With the hieroglyphic was a different kind of what we call it levels of hieroglyphic, demotic and hieroglyphic and the heretic. They decided to use material founded around them. Stone from the desert, they used to be like documentations. We have limestone, sandstone, granite, and basalt. Sometimes they wrote on wood. So we had wood, we had everything. But imagine if you want to document things and you have to carry a piece of stone with you and it was really hard to move it from one city to the other one. So kindly, they recognize the papyrus reeds or what you call it, the bulrushes on the banks of the Nile. So they cut and they harvest those reeds and they use the pulp of the reeds and they create paper. When I mention paper, you better know that this is the oldest paper was recorded in the human history. Even before anybody else made any paper, the papyrus was the most valuable material used by Egyptian. Egyptian for the purpose of the papyrus, if you look at the next slide, the, the actually, the, it's a piece of very simple piece of paper. You can just put everything in there, send it as a message, store it in an archive system or in a library to be used by the other people. So the needs and the use of the daily, daily writing, it became very important. And temples, all of a sudden, they start to be what we call it as schools of life. Every single temple, it's as a place to worship the God, it used to have a school teaching people. And Egyptian, they saw the value of that paper, which is founded in the Nile, and they built up a market and a city. The city today located in Lebanon, and this city over the Mediterranean is called Babylos. And if you needed anything from Egypt, you bring your best goods ever, and then you're going to have a small piece of that papyrus, you take it back home with you. So this papyrus in ancient time, it was like money. It was like kind of a trade, a trade way. You parter your goods with papyrus. Look here at those two beautiful pieces of papyrus. When you look at them, reading hieroglyphic and understanding what was in there, I always tell people this is like, you're looking at the ancient Bible of the Egyptian. This is their Bible. We had a Bible today, but how, we, how come we're going to understand the Bible? We understand the Bible by hieroglyphic, we understand the Bible by looking at those paper and documentation they created. That first one, it's one of my favorite. We call it the final judgment. As a concept of duality and all of the ancient pharaohs, they have to, to, be, to be preserved, to be mummified, to be buried in the tomb. What is going to happen to them, they have to be judged. They have to be examined. They were good or bad. So the top piece of paper, you can see they have like a scale and it looks like a dog in there. This is a jackal god and a crocodile just sitting underneath. And they're putting the heart of the dead or deceased people and they're waiting them to see if they were good or bad, heavy or, or, or light. It deserved paradise or deserved hell. The bottom one, where is Anubis, this beautiful god, the jackal god, the god of embalming and mummification is standing. He's standing down there and he's teaching Egyptian the techniques how bodies, they got mummified. So we learn from the hieroglyphic, we learn from the ancient painting and art how Egyptian lived and we learned how their Bible, their life, their death, their journey, it was all about. Moving on with the slides. For, for that beautiful stories and ideas and thoughts, Egyptian they create like a class system. They needed somebody as a ruler or a warrior or a god on earth. And this god on earth was named Pharaoh or in ancient time, they named him in hieroglyphic Ber-Ah, that was his name. Ber-Ah, Greek, they call him Beru 
and then ended in Latin and in English as a pharaoh. Pharaoh is the top. Pharaoh always regarded as a, an image of the God on earth, keeping the order, keeping the law, keeping the system for the universe and the cosmos. With the Pharaoh being the top of everything, just underneath him, he had the assistant. This assistant will be like Nobleman's, and those Nobleman will, will do anything for the Pharaoh. They're going to be with him there. And with them, we had the high priests and people working in a temple, in, in a religious places. This is all considered like the elite and the top class of the Egyptian society. Middle class, we come to the merchant, the scribe, physicians, you know, uh, artisans. This is all will be the assistant, those all highly regarded, those people will always be buried next to the pharaohs, like they got guarantee from the pharaoh, they're going to reach after life safely and they're going to enjoy after life. And then the poor people of ancient Egypt, they were the slaveries and the farmers, peasants, you know, working very hard. And we have to admit that with that beautiful classification, uh, a corrupted system was introduced in ancient time and that was taxation. Every single farmers and every single workers and the slaves in ancient time used to give almost 60% taxation for the fair. You can imagine how sometimes people they get so angry and how sometimes people they really disliked that pharaoh just to collect 60% of the land. And a good example was mentioned in the Bible. It was talking about Joseph, son of Israel, when he started talking to the Egyptian about the seven, you know, plenty years and the seven famine years and how he would start partnering the land and taking the crops from them to store it in the storehouses. So this is what the system, how Egyptian they lived. And always remember, Pharaoh, he was a divine blood. Pharaoh, he was always like the God on earth. Nobody will disagree. Nobody will actually even just dislike or announce his disagreement with the Pharaoh. Egyptians now created like system to live, they created faith, they had their writings, they had an art. Art in the in Egyptian time, it was used to reflect faith, belief, glory, sometimes revolutionary art, it was there. Uh, once in our history, it's around uh, 15th century BC, we had a beautiful queen, she had a dream to rule the country and she managed to be the ruler and her name was Hatshepsut. This lady, she had the beautiful monuments, and I have to admit, she was a founder for a new art style and a fashion of the Egyptian art. When you travel anywhere in the world, in the global museums, you see any statue with an almond-shaped eyes, with an arch's head, with like a gracious smile, with a high cheekbones. This is the style where Hatshepsut created to reflect her wisdom, her strength, her power. And you can see that beautifully with that bust and that statue actually displayed from the Egyptian museum. To that statue, with the statuaries, they had to carve things on wall or they had to make like a replica for the facial feature of the dead people. It doesn't matter what this replica made out of. Sometimes gold like King Tutankhamen, and sometimes it was stone. Sometimes it was just, you know, very simple material wood. So it just they needed replica to locate them in the tombs. The concept of the art, I want to be eternal. I want to be immortal. So they start developing themselves and they created different statues, different replicas, different busts, just to reflect that. This is a golden mask of the King Tutankhamen. And this golden mask, it's like a, one of the, it's one of its, its unique kind pieces. We had at the Egyptian Museum here, a pure gold around 10 and a half kilogram with lapis lazuli, turquoise, and malachite. And look at the cobra and the vulture, you know, in the forehead. This is the goddess of Upper and Lower Egypt. It is one of the best pieces we had it up there. And that piece is gonna move soon to the new Egyptian museum. So people coming, which is maybe around July next year, or maybe September, they're gonna open this beautiful museum for King Gitter and Camon artifacts. Coming, and continue with art and looking at those beautiful beasts. Sometimes art was like showing off. Ramesses II, this great king of Egypt, which is I always tell my groups, you know, this is like Rainbow the second of ancient time, the greatest warrior. He was everywhere in Egypt. He conquered all the land uh, till uh, Iraq today and to the heart of Africa. So his monuments carved everywhere. And for him, size and scale was really matter. 
the biggest statue we had it to reflect the power of Ramesses. It's actually located in Abu Simbel. This is part of, of our programs. You know, we're gonna see that beautiful temple, but this is a really nice shot to look at the size, look at the lips, the way eyes, uh, the eyes being curved and the full Sibrid sign of royalty. And to the right of that statue, we had one of those earliest peace agreement that happened between him and some of the Hittites kings. With the size, with the Ramesses II, Ramesses as well, he built us a beautiful hypostyle court in Karnak, which is a second slide. We're gonna show it for you. You see at uh, this columns, 134, representing all the gods, representing the delta, the thicket of the papyrus that found it up there. When you walk in Karnak, kids of the villages up there, they used to play hide and seek. It is the biggest colonnade and court with many columns in Egypt and in anywhere else. Columns, the, the top and the capital of the columns, they can carry sometimes like more than 30 and 40 people. It depends on which capital you're looking at. Look at the amount of the color in some of the columns. Unfortunately, water erosion and the flood that happened over centuries and people, they didn't look after those monuments in the 15th, 16th century AD, badly rowing so most of the color faded but you can still see some of those higher lintel the name of Ramesses and his titles and that's again kind of like showing off the way how I'm, I'm a great builder so I'm a great warrior as well as I'm a great builder with that and the symbolism of the papyrus that are reflected in those columns we will see another symbolism of the art representing the god Amun-Ra in a shape and a figure of a ram those fertile animals, Egyptian, they always link them with a the god in the midday. Fertility comes out of the ram, so they put it as an image for the god. So the god Amun-Ra became so well known with the ram god, and in between the bows of the statue and underneath the chain, you see very small statue. This is Ramses II again, like he's telling us, I am the placid son of the god Amun-Ra. I am there, I am the fertile, I am the, the icon of the god on earth. This is very beautiful. Avenue of Sphinx located outside Karnak Temple itself. And again, we move on. You will see the coming slide. It's very, very interesting and very symbolic. Egyptians, they thought creations to the whole world come out of darkness. And this darkness, the whole world from the point of view, it was more like a primeval water, dark water. In the dark water, a mound or kind of a mountain with a primedium top appeared and this is where light or life existed. When we wander in some of the Egyptian temples, you're gonna see what we call it sacred lakes or an ancient Egyptian swimming pool. This swimming pool, it was used as a daily baptism for the ancient priests. They have to go to shave to get polluted and washed before they would do the ritual. And at the same time, it was actually all created just to make uh, the reminder for them, this is creation, darkness, water, life comes out of it. So this is a sacred lake of Karnak, which is still life and water still there. And the coming one, it's actually a, a good and link to that. This is the obelisk or what you call it, the Kilobatra needles. Again, creation, messages. You can call that text messages, you know, of ancient time. Prayer was written on the side of this obelisk, pointing up to the heaven. And then they do believe the postman or the Benu bird, or what we call it, the phoenix bird in our term, gonna come, nest at the top, read the messages, take it to the God Ra. So again, this is kind of like, you know, simple and symbolic idea about faith and about creation and how all used in ancient time. Moving on more, we come now with the art, with the glory of the gods, with the creation story, with showing off a story, Temples in ancient time as well, it was sometimes like, instead of being a used to worship God, it was like for a funeral temple, for the dead, for personal glory. Ramesses II made this amazing temple that we call it the Ramesseum. And in that temple, by the way, the biggest statue ever recognized in the human history, it was located there and it was called Osmandis, the statue made out of granite exceed a thousand ton of one solid piece of granite. So Ramesses in his funerary temple was really showing off his talent, scale, size, power. And around the whole area, you see those little mud. Some of them do look like arches, some do look like a canal. These were like a storehouses 
to represent, you know, food that gets stored in that temple and used by the people. So we had funerary temple at like the Ramesseum, we had Karnak, we had another temple which is very unusual in the southern part of Aswan by the border of Sudan, we call it Abu Simbel. This, <clears throat> sorry, this temple of Abu Simbel, it was kind of an idea for Ramesses II to divine himself. He traveled in the heart of Nubia or the heart of Aswan or the southern part of Egypt and he built two temples and he located those temples in that little area to celebrate his birthday and a coronation day with an equinox. So now astrology it became very important element in Egyptian construction and in Egyptian archaeology. So we had temples oriented to the sun twice a year. The sun will illuminate the entrance of the temple, illuminate the king's face for a few minutes to celebrate his birthday or coronation day. Look at this kind of amazing scale carved scene of Ramesses II sitting in the outer area of the temple and by the way this is something very interesting to know in ancient time when Ramesses built the temple in the area he used to celebrate his birthday and a coronation day on 21st of October and 21st of February but unfortunately when the high dam of Egypt was built the world decided to cut the temple and move it in another safer area because the water of the reservoir of the high dam will cover and destroy this temple. The American, Egyptians, French, Italians, the world, the whole world start working together, cutting this temple to blocks and then move it in an island on the same axis to keep the equinox that the temple was built for it happening till today. They moved the temple and everybody was so keen to keep that location of the temple and the other one for Queen Nefertari. And unfortunately, they realized in our modern technology, we couldn't be accurate as the ancient Egyptian. We moved the axis of the temple 0 0.03 degree from the real axis. And today we celebrate the birthday and the coronation day of the Pharaoh on the 22nd of October and the 22nd of Feb because of that mistake we made that would tell you how ancient Egyptian they were so advanced in astrology and calculations and math. This is a second temple of Abu Simbel, where is the beautiful Nefertari, his wife, that linked to the goddess of love and sexuality. It was oriented and the temple was carved out of a sandy stone. This temple, by the way, we take a flight from Aswan and we just go up there for like 45 minutes flight to enjoy this temple. And unfortunately that temple it was enlisted in the ancient wonders of the world because it was buried in sand totally till 1813. So this temple, by the way, it's one of the top 20 sites in your life. You, you should see it. And that's the Ramesses II defining himself, defining his wife in that magnificent place. Next slide. We're looking at very weird figure. We're looking at like an eggy shaped skull, very thick lips. And, you know, the body, if you look at those cards, see to the right, the body looks like a mixture of feminine and male aspects. What was going on here? In our history, sometimes a revolution happened and religious revolution happened. Development, somebody declaring, I hate all those gods. I hate Amun Ra. There is only one God that moves the earth. This God called Aten. And my name will be Akinaten. And this man is actually the father of King Etat. And he traveled when he was a king of Egypt. He built a new capital. He founded new faith. His name was Amenhotep IV. And then he changed his name to become Akhenaten. He was married to the famous queen of Egypt, Nefertiti, with a beautiful bust. I'm sure you all know it. The man tried to call for a new faith and new religion. Many books have been written about this Egyptian ruler and the link to him was Abraham, the biblical prophet, because they used to call him the first monotheistic belief and believer and a messenger and a prophet from ancient time. Akhenaten, his death and life, it was very mysterious. Till today, we didn't know where is the body and the tombs of Akhenaten or Nefertiti. This is a city he created, and he made a great slogan for his faith and belief. Sundisk, again, it was there but they no longer, they call it Ra, it was called Aten. And then with the sun disk, they had those beautiful rays that goes down to place the people, the couple, the city, Egypt, the world, 
with hands of the God. Sometimes those hands, they became like an ankh, key of life, symbol of ancient Egypt, sign of eternity. But this is all about that family. And again, in 2021, we're having some British archaeologists, the, the digging at the Valley of the Kings, and they are assuming they will discover a Canaan and the Fertiti tomb in the Valley of the Kings. This man, he was very unique. His art was very unique. His time and period, very unique. And even his death, very mysterious. And his son, King Etat, succeeded him, and Egypt moved to the old religion again. So unfortunately, it was a matter of like 12, 15 years. That was his time and then gone and everything and all the belief he built up, it was totally disappeared and vanished. Next slide. With whatever the belief of the Egyptian, they followed the god Amen-Ra or they followed the god Aten. They were, they were like, you know, ruling Egypt or there were other non-Egyptian ruler. Egyptian, they needed to preserve their bodies for the afterlife. That was their main goal. Mummies created and physicians, they were so regarded. The techniques of the mummification, techniques of preserving bodies and desiccation techniques they learned from the sand, it was very important and very secret and sacred as well. We had few mummies till today, we don't know how they've been preserved. Many people and many tries and people claim they knew the chemicals. We had the chemicals written in hieroglyphic, but we don't know what is the equivalent in English. Boxes or containers to keep those mummies in the tombs. They were built up sometimes of wood, sometimes of stone, replicas and statues like the mask, the golden mask, and the, the, the reserve heads located in a tomb. It was all a matter of like just a reserve, keeping the body and keeping the spirit life in the afterlife. Mummifications with the technique of physicians and those high educated people, they actually needed kind of a container for the afterlife journey. So when they took off the organs in a visera, they used to put them in such a jar, we call them canopic jars, which is some, some of them, they had a, a head of a, a baboon or, you know, like a jackal or a falcon or like a human. This is where all the visera, stomach, intensis, lung, liver, they were all stored in those beautiful jars. And we have hundreds of them at the Egyptian museums and uh, all over Egypt, they scattered all over Egypt. With that, people who built up that glory for the Egyptian, like a nobleman, this picture on the left-hand side, it's from an amazing tomb in Luxor. We call it Menina tomb. And this Menina tomb, it's a beautiful tomb. You wouldn't believe that. This is around like 1200 years BC with the color and look at the ceiling, they create like a vine leaves and a graves up in the ceiling, like a 3D, you know, tomb. This is how they regarded the noblemen and assistants and a physician who assist them. All in here, scattered in a West Bank of Luxor, tell us about life of those people and the work and the positions. On the right hand side, you can see one of the gods blessing one of the prayers and the people by sending all those amazing rays of the sun. This is like an initiating, you know, the energy and the life in the spirit of that female or that, you know, kind of a human standing before it, while the, the eye above them and the sun dislocated. This is, again, all workers' tomb and the noblemen tombs. We had a great imagination about life of ancient Egypt regarding, and we got that from the tomb of those people. With all of that Egyptian amazing, mysterious stories about life, death, noblemen, mummification, architecture, stones. Travelers, even from a Greek time, you imagine that, you know, we had a Greek travelers, they came to Egypt up here and they carved the names. The Egypt for them was very fascinating. They came up to Egypt up here and they start painting things. Around 15, 16, 17th century AD, Many travelers, they came from the whole world and they used to come. If they could carry a piece of the Egyptian monuments, they would take it with them. If not, they will do some picture like one of the famous 18th, 19th century, you know, traveler and a painter. It was D David Roberts, which is, you see all those black and white picture. You see some of the temples being, the columns fall in, sands covering the temple. Those travelers, they've done their best to solve the mystery of ancient Egypt. Unfortunately, none of them managed to do that, and some of them turned to become like, a, a, like kind of like, I call it archaeologists, but some people, they love to call them thieves 
of antiquities. They used to take monuments, sell it to the rich men in Europe at those days. And unlikely, most of the Egyptian monuments that moved outside Egypt was by those earliest travelers. But we had a great picture to the Cuban temples from their time. Suddenly, 1799, the French, when they conquered Egypt, they get so admired and they loved the Egyptian monuments too. And they worked very hard and they managed, somebody called Francois Champollion, he managed to decipher the writing out of one of the stones being discovered in a city called Rosetta. And since 1799 till 1823, the, the man spent around 24 years working with a British, like he was a French and a British archaeologist, both of them, they managed to decipher the stone and Egyptology department in the whole world started. And thanks for this British, if British and French, you know, gentlemen who helped us to understand demotic, hieroglyphic, and we understood the Egyptian faith and belief and life using the hieroglyphic there. We are here for you. Uh, please let us know whenever, uh, please call us and feel free to uh, communicate, communicate with us with any help we can help you or any booking that you may have. And from here, let's go to the questions. Can All right, Tahala, thank you. Look, just one last thing about the LSTD. Really, the LSTDs were an opportunity to get into a destination, experience the main attraction, the off a beaten path, free time, high end, uh, four star, five star accommodations, and an experience where a lot of travelers like to have some coordination in their schedule, but they like to have that free time. So, really created this terrific hybrid. Uh, if you'll control the questions, uh, Zahava, that'll be great. And uh, Zizo, if you want to unmute yourself in case the question is going to be directed to you. And then okay. once we get done with this, and listen, you can uh, go to our website and get all this. By the way, this webinar is recorded. All of our webinars are recorded. They're hosted. They'll be, you'll get an email following up with this, sharing it with you. But we also do some editing of it and post it at our YouTube, iWorld to Travel at YouTube forward slash iWorld to Travel. Or you can go to our website, iWorldtotravel.com forward slash video, and you'll have all the education, destination, and webinar uh uh, video is available to share with your team, to share with your clients. And if it's not enough information there, we'll do a personal Zoom or webinar for your team or for your clients or for any group. Again, utilize this as a resource. Uh, we have 30 global partners uh, with, with our as talented, as passionate, as you heard, Zizo, uh, that really understand the destination. The, really, the only way you can learn about a destination is if you live there, if you've been from there, uh, or if you're represented. And so we have partners that have done all three. Any, so the questions, uh, any questions, Zahava? Yeah, uh, one, of the que uh, when the, one of the questions is, uh, are there any synagogues still functioning in Egypt? So I think that, uh, uh, Zizo, if you may Yes, ask. yes, there is, there is one synagogue still functioning, you know, in the downtown area of Cairo. Yes, it, and there is one in Alexandria as well. There is one in Cairo, one in Alex. Yes, there is. Uh, and uh, not only that there is a synagogue, many times we, uh, and I encourage travel agents, if you know that your clients are really, it's important for them to include a, a, such a visit to a synagogue and so on and so forth. In FAT, we can always include it. And believe me, this is a great experience for your clients and something that uh, they will uh, never forget, I promise you. Um, how do we register with iWorld? Michael, do you want to answer? When you say register, what do they mean? Register? Yeah, they mean to say that there are many, uh, uh, many companies that you have to register uh, uh, to the company in order to get a lot of information to the website. Um, so our website, so our website is uh, is public, but it's very. There's no. If you go to our website, it's all the resources available for you. And even listen, when you're working with clients these days, and we know this, they always want to know who you're partnering with. So our website is user friendly, not just for you, but also for your clients, and it's got a tremendous amount of resources. But anytime, if you want anything specific that's designed for you, uh, just email either myself or Zahava Baton, uh, and it's really our, it's our first initial. Or first name, last name at iworldtotravel.com. So L M Gelber at iworldtotravel.com or Z Batone at iworldtotravel.com. Uh, we are working on a travel advisor portal. Uh, we started that. <laughs> we, we were starting that at the beginning of this year, the end of last year, the beginning of this year. Uh, COVID-19 kind of redirected some of our focus. We really uh, 
we, we put the brakes on some of those expansions as we grew our educational format uh, to make sure that people were and agents were informed and had the resources they need. So once we get to the day after, uh, you had the opportunity to start creating some bookings. But uh, if you need any, any, as far as our, and obviously if you're part of the webinar, you were already registered with our newsletter and our newsletter is probably one of the best resources of getting up to date information that only goes out to the travel advisors. So we have already answered and uh, once again, uh, um, are we recording this, uh, uh, this session? Yes, we do record it, right? We, and, it's not only recorded, but they'll get uh, within an hour, they'll get a copy of it as a registered participant. And then again, we edit it uh, to bring it down just to the specific destination. We take care, we take, we get rid of our stuff, you know, for the iWorld stuff and just have it specific to the destination. And then it's hosted on our YouTube page as well as our website so that you can use for yourself and or uh, to share with your clients. And listen, one of the things Zahaba talks about quite often is, you know, you can take these videos, you can either take the, vi you can take the videos. If you look at our videos, uh, uh, we have webinar videos, but we also have destination videos. At the beginning of this webinar, you saw the two minute video on Egypt. We have about 30 plus destinations on our website that those are nice to use as marketing tools for yourself on your social media or on in an e-newsletter that or newsletter that you want to send out to your clients. If you need any help crafting anything or putting together a document or to create something that gets embedded into your email, again, we want to be viewed as a marketing arm for you. Just let us know. We don't charge for it. This is what we do with open arms. Uh, it's the philosophy my father established 40, you know, four decades ago uh, is that we are the source and the resource for the travel advisor community. So uh, we continue to want to be that for you. So we answered also already this question, but I still want to read it. Uh, this is so interesting. Where can I get more information like this? Once again, communicate with us. We have we spoke about the, uh, the videos, the webinars, the, and so many other things that we can uh, cooperate and do together. Absolutely uh, reach out to us. And, uh, and let me just add to that, Zahava, that if you have groups uh, or cl clients or a group or a church or a temple that you're interested in kind of getting them, getting them uh, to consider taking this trip to Egypt, we will set up a private webinar zoom meeting we'll bring zizo in and we'll do a specific presentation tailored just for you from your agency to your clients again look at us as your in-house marketing department and education department uh and just ask uh there's really not much we wouldn't do uh in terms of assisting with because again we have relationships with over 30 tourism boards throughout the uh, the globe, probably, like actually 50 tourism boards and 30 partners uh, that are boots on the ground. So just just let us know what you need. So another comment and an excellent presentation. I went to Egypt in 2012 uh, and has, uh, she is waiting for it again. Hopefully she will be able to use the link. We will, of course, send you the link and send you the presentation so you will be able to use it. Absolutely. Do you provide headsets on the tour, especially for hearing impaired? Uh, that would be Zizo. Yes, yeah, we, we, for, for the, our luxury groups, we provide, uh, yes, uh, like a headset, yeah. I mean for commission, and uh, do you need Ayata or Sklia, etc. for the commission, probably? Uh, so there is no website portal, uh, the, the, so what I, I understand from the question is that if the client can book with us, we work only with travel agents. We do not work with uh, the public. Uh, and if you need a YATA number or CLIA number, yes, you need a YATA number and CLIA number in order to receive commission from us. Michael, do you want to add on it? No, that's exactly correct. I mean, uh, we don't, we don't, we don't uh, work direct with the consumer. Uh, our client is a travel advisor. Uh, and again, we, we take it uh, very seriously, the, uh, uh, the trust that's placed in us to be able to take care of them exactly as you would take care of them as an extension of your family. So uh, we're a direct resource just for the travel advisor community. And uh, the other question is, do you offer fem trip for agents? Absolutely. You know, that's funny. We get that question asked every time, but yeah. you know, we, we were known as the educational tour company. Uh, in 2019, we had 10. 
uh, that we put together. And we make them very specific. We don't let anybody and everybody go. Uh, we handpick people who have, you know, the, the, the database or the clientele that are interested. Uh, we keep it intimate. We keep it uh, eight, no more than 10 travel advisors. Uh, and it's very specific. As an example, last year we also did South Africa. It was 11 days. Zahava was on that. It was an 11 day uh, educational tour through South Africa, Cape Town, uh, some of the uh, some of the safaris. Uh, it would have been for a client. It would have been probably uh, a 12 to 15 thousand dollar trip uh, that we were able to put together with support from the tourism board and our partner down there for under 1500 dollars for 11 days. So we do a tremendous amount. We have great resources and partnerships. You know, obviously 2020 was a, a year that we had anticipated doing uh, 10 to 12. Uh, we all know the, what happened there, but uh, in 2021, we're probably not going to be starting right away. Listen, I think we all see what's happening. The good news is that there seems to be the light at the end of the tunnel is getting a little bit closer with uh, two to three companies having a vaccine. Borders are opening up. You can do some pre-testing prior to going out there, but I still think what's going to happen, just my opinion, uh, if a vaccine wasn't so close, people would start taking the te start taking the, s the steps to do the pretest and start moving forward. But when you see something that close, I think what we're going to see now is an extension of delay of travel because people say, oh, the vaccine's around the corner. I'm just going to wait for that now. And I think we're going to see in the first quarter of 2021, people starting to look at and book some for the summer, end of the year. But 2022 is really going to be, I think, the, the big uh, movement on travel. So my answer on the FAM trips, uh, if we can, we will uh, look to be doing some FAM trips towards the, uh, the mid, uh, probably from April, May till about September of uh, 2021. Again, we want to make sure that uh, you know, uh, we have the ability to uh, find participants who want to take advantage of those opportunities too. Great. So we have uh, just more, a couple of questions. Great presentation. Do you quote in Canadian dollars? Well, listen. Uh, you, you, you can. You can. <laughs> we 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 don't quote in Canadian dollars, but what we do is we. Uh, quote in U.S. dollars, and then we provide what the current conversion rate is. And what we normally do when we're doing quotes like that, uh, we put a little buffer in in case uh, we see historically that the conversion rate changes. But if it's you know if it's a pretty steady conversion rate, we have no problem quoting in whatever um, monetary needs you have. And another question: It is for Zizo. Is a visit to Siwa Oasis possible? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. We got. We just we send people up there to Siwa, so it's very easy. It can be arranged easily and for the length people they need. Yeah, if you need two, three, four days, yes, easily can be done. Yeah. Uh, another question. Uh, amazing presentation. Truly looking forward to work with you guys, and personally experience for myself. Thank you. That was a comment. Mask and another question: Must masks uh, be worn for the tours? What are other restrictions? And I believe that this is for the COVID uh, uh, situation. Yep. Okay. You, uh, first, masks must be worn during the tour. Second, sanitizers. You know, found it in the bus. Social and distancing. Like for our small group, we're having 52 seats bus for 14 members, that's 52, so social distance as well. And every day all our buses get sterilized, okay, on daily basis. So yeah, masks, yes, hand sanitizers and alcohol, it's everywhere there. And social distancing as well, and sanitizing and sterilizing the buses daily. So this is all what we do. Uh, I think that it was the last question, and uh, Michael, if I may uh, add, uh, uh, you know, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we had a, uh, we had a booking to Egypt. It was a last minute booking uh, for a person who wanted to visit Egypt. So I encourage you uh, to, if you have any uh, requests for Egypt, please go ahead and say, yes, we can visit Egypt. Egypt is open for tourists. Uh, it is uh, safe and the client came back and was very happy with uh, his visit uh, to Cairo and to the Red Sea. So uh, please communicate, communicate with us. And you know, Ziva, the, the groups you've been talking about, you know, they actually, they had the temples and the sites for themselves. So, you know, they, they honestly, they had like a private visit to every single place. So they were so, so excited and so happy. So booking early 
and you know like early of this year before the crowds that's again another advantage and i see just now another question can a client be met in taba yes the client can be met in taba right absolutely yes yeah we can be by the border so they can come from israel egypt can be you can come to to egypt two two ways number one you can go to the border through taba and again you go to sinai or you can fly from tel aviv to Cairo, this is like 40 minute flight and it is a, a daily flight from Tel Aviv to Cairo. So yes, you can meet in Taba or you can fly to Cairo. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, many of the Christian groups would uh, pass actually would move uh, from Taba to Egypt, will visit uh, Sinai, St. Catherine and then continue uh, uh, to visit uh, Egypt as well as uh, clients who would visit Israel, would like to uh, spend some time in by the Red Sea to uh, um, you know, to uh, dive, relax, dive, and all or that, yeah. just relax. Absolutely. And then continue to Cairo and uh, continue to uh, uh, Egypt. So I think that uh, uh, we answered all the questions, right? Any other questions? Uh, that's it, Michael. Now it's, uh, <laughs> I'm okay. passing it to you. Well, listen, that was, uh, again, I can't thank you enough, uh, Zizo. It was such a fantastic uh, presentation. I know uh, many people will be uh, reviewing it again as we send it out. Thank you, Ashraf, thank you. Zahava, thank you. Everybody, thank you for, for, for participation. Stay safe, uh, stay positive uh, for the balance of 2020. Uh, 2021 is right around the corner. And uh, as I said, we, uh, the, the light at the end of the tunnel seems to be getting a little bit brighter. We still have a little bit of ways to go. But the, the more prepared, listen, my wife and well, I, before we got married, I'm just going to share this, uh, my, my recent wife, my second wife, is uh, before we got married, we went to counseling. And one of the things we learned was real quick was uh, you want to prepare so you don't want to have to repair. And so what we're all doing right now is preparing for what we need to do down the road for 2021 so we don't have to worry about repairing at that point. With that, thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to working with you and hearing more from you. Have a great day.